few days ago, I released a video called The Most Hated Teaching of Jesus. There's been a flood of mail in response to that video asking for further clarification. To be honest, a lot of it has been from people telling me in one way or another that the teaching of Jesus about living by faith won't work, or that it contradicts something that Paul said. Obviously, there are arguments that will be raised, and people have the right to raise them. I'm not a particularly patient person, however, and so if I were to go through and write a response to each of these people personally, by the end I might be raising my voice in frustration. So rather than scare you away, I'm going to try to address some of these issues here, and hopefully do so patiently. Well, as patiently as I can, given my prickly disposition. That way I can just refer people to this video for at least some of your answers. First, I should confess that my reaction was almost exactly the same when I discovered more than 45 years ago what Jesus actually told his followers to do. Most of us have taken it for granted all our lives that you can't really follow Jesus the way his disciples did because he's not here anymore. And we've never met anyone else who does what his disciples did. But we read in the book of Acts that thousands of believers all forsook everything they had when they joined the church and that the church distributed from those resources to everyone who had a need. And Jesus wasn't there. So it can still happen today, even though Jesus is not here physically. It helps, of course, if we have honest and experienced leaders who can share their understanding of the teachings of Jesus with us, like the apostles did in those early days. It also helps that we have the Holy Spirit now, and we have the teachings of Jesus in the Bible to help us keep on track. So why don't we do it? This is where I want you to consider that we mostly don't do it because we don't want to do it. Now, isn't that true? It's so much easier to just go on the way we were before. All we ever had to do before was just sit in pews and listen to various theological and doctrinal arguments. It was all theory with no more real risk than, well, playing a video game. But this letting go of everything, stepping out of the boat and walking on water called living by faith, well, that's going a bit overboard, isn't it? Pun intended. And that's why most of you won't budge, even after you've listened to this video. But let's say that you really do want to know the truth. I think a genuinely sincere person will be able to recognize the signs in their own spirit that they're fighting something bigger than both of us. I had to go through this when I first discovered Jesus when so many of the same excuses went through my mind many years ago. Now, the next most common defense is something like this. Okay, I'll do it. I'll give up everything I own, but only if God tells me to. I'm not going to do it just because you say God wants me to do it. Can you see a flaw in this argument? Suppose someone said, born again? That may be what you call it, but God hasn't told me to do it. Or what if someone said, give up prostitution? Who are you to tell me that I should give up prostitution? I feel that God led me here and I'm staying here until he sends an angel to tell me otherwise. Obviously, if you can argue that your so-called private leadings trump the teachings of Jesus in the Bible, then you have to allow everyone else to do the same thing. Anyone just says, God hasn't told me to do that or God has told me to do this and that ends the argument. Throw the Bible out. Pretty dumb reasoning, isn't it? Oop, sorry pretty um, questionable reasoning, isn't it? Probably the most universal argument is the tent maker one. It hits the list of a few quotes from Paul, which are used to supposedly cancel out Jesus. Of course, no one ever quotes Paul saying, if I or an angel from heaven tells you anything contrary to the gospel which you have already received, let me be accursed. So you need to back off and get things into perspective in this imaginary battle between Paul and Jesus. Do you really think you can pull out some rather paltry quotes from Paul to present as your defense for disobeying Jesus on Judgment Day? I don't like your chances if you do. Very briefly, the tent-making story goes like this. Paul split up with another Christian worker. He found himself all alone in Corinth, contrary to the usual practice of going two by two. He met a couple who made tents, and since he'd made a tent or two before he became a Christian, he moved in with them, and they started a business. Then the Bible says that some other disciples arrived and Paul was pricked in his conscience and gave himself full time to the work of the gospel. He moved out of that house and into a place closer to the temple 
where he could work night and day preaching the gospel. Paul later wrote to the church in Corinth saying that this was the only church where he had ever tried to do it that way, paying for his own support. Even though he was still somewhat defensive about his right to do that, he did ask them to, quote, forgive me for this wrong. But like I said, there are other teachings of Paul which were also brought in. He wrote to the Thessalonians, for example, that if anyone would not work, they should not eat. That was an understandable thing to say in a church where all of the believers lived together and ate all their meals together. There was no room for slackers who were just coming along for a free meal and a free ride. Everyone had to pull their fair share of the weight. But when Paul said work, there was no mention of money in the original Greek. It was all about performing the various duties that needed to be done within the Christian community. Whether it was organizing meals or doing laundry or just heading out on the streets to preach the gospel, everyone was expected to work. Of course, the passage means nothing in today's churches because they don't feed you, do they? You could be Jesus himself and they wouldn't feed you. And you could be the laziest person in the world and no one in your church is going to stop you from eating. You just go out, get some money or get some benefits from the government and you start eating. There's another argument based on a misunderstanding about what Paul did with his time. He reminded the Thessalonians that he himself had worked night and day when he was with them. Remember, the whole tent making debacle started and ended with the Corinthians, so he wasn't making tents there. Still, there are a lot of people who will tell you that Paul worked for money during the day and he held tent crusades in the evening. Wrong. Again, there is no mention of money in the original. He said he worked night and day doing what? Read it right there in 1 Thessalonians. Preaching the gospel. Night and day he preached the gospel. Well, that covers a few of the excuses. Of course, there are many more that more imaginative people will come up with. But hopefully this is enough to show you how it really all comes down to what you want to believe. The saddest thing about these arguments is how people deceive one another by saying that God told them to do this or that. When really, they just chose to do what they wanted to do. Someone once said to me, Well, the same day that you talked to me about working for Jesus, someone came up and offered me a job. So I took it as a sign from God he wanted me working in a job for now. Can you see the bias in his interpretation of the facts? God had sent me. The devil had sent someone offering him a paycheck. So he interpreted the paycheck as coming from God and me as coming from some evil source. Okay, so that's it. Sorry this is so rushed, but I did want to help people get these side issues into better perspective quickly, while the whole issue of obeying Jesus is fresh in your mind. I'll have more to say soon, so please subscribe to this channel and click the notification link, the little bell symbol, so that you will be notified as new videos become available. Thank you.